Good Wednesday morning, and welcome to Ice Age TV, the internal combustion engine age YouTube channel with the dog going to the bathroom in front of you. Sorry about that. Yeah, the internal combustion engine age YouTube channel that talks about all my cars and trucks and motorcycles and SUVs, tractors, the dogs, Kiefer, the troublemaker. Come on, pups. Get up here. Come on. What's going on with you guys? So, uh, hey, good Wednesday morning there. Thanks for tuning my channel. It's actually be kind of warm today. I'm changed up my look today with my Triumph gear on. The Ace uh, Club, apparently that's some British, the England, the English guys that are the Triumph fans. That's their, I guess their riding club or something like that. And Triumph just doesn't have a lot of uh, paraphernalia. It's crazy. I and mean, they don't really have a lot of stuff for you to, uh, to get besides the uh, real motorcycle leather jacket or the riding pants and gloves but just as far as the hoodies shirts they're pretty spartan in our world known brain i just don't get that harley makes so much money off of that paraphernalia so uh drinking my coffee here as i do each morning to get my mustache nice and brown for you be gray but i guess that's how i can dye it to look brown right come on pop get up here come on let's go ginger baby so come on babe hey keeper and there they go it's the, the never-ending chase one another so uh so yeah so got my coffee in my hand and i thought wow monday was the bankruptcy conversation tuesday was the wealth conversation then i thought you know what would be a great conversation is coffee and if you're the coffee person um what better way to spend your time but drinking coffee and talking about uh various things and who doesn't do that? And as we all know, what's the big uh, name is cars and coffee. And for me, I've been very intrigued to do some research on coffee and Starbucks, which I never ever have. And I've always have known who Howard Schultz is, but I never really knew the true uh, beginnings of where Starbucks came from. Very interesting. If you look that up, it is a great story of how that came to be. So I thought today would be a great conversation because the, the coffee um, really um, really kind of got the car meat thing going, but really it was Barry McGuire. Barry McGuire, who the, one of the founders of uh, McGuire Products, he was one of the true uh, guys that got the, uh, the cars and coffee thing going in California back in 2000 years. And it really didn't become official till like 2005 of the first real cars and coffee event in Southern California. And so, and all, we all know, if you're the car motorhead enthusiast, you probably participate in somewhere in the country on a weekend, a car and coffee, cars and coffee event. And some are, have, you know, exclusive dates and times and other things like that. Um, but the interesting thing is it all kind of correlates with the coffee, which you can probably thank Starbucks for being the real trendsetter of getting people to get out and get coffee. In fact, my dad, uh, my dad gets out of bed every day just to go to Starbucks and get some coffee. I mean, I'm not lying. He literally gets out of bed every day and he drives to town to get his cup of uh, Starbucks. That's his daily routine. And if he doesn't do that, he's so bummed. And it's just incredible how Starbucks created my dad's adventures. <coughs> I'm still coughing. Sorry for the <coughs> terrible cough. But it is what it is. So sorry about that. But anyways, so for my father, he's a huge Starbucks guy. And it's just incredible on how Starbucks, how it came from Seattle, Washington. And how two, I believe, college friends and some other guy all kind of got together. But what's interesting about that is that um, they weren't selling coffee. They were selling coffee beans. But anyways, before we get into all that detail, it, you know, the one thing about the cars and coffee, as you know, you bring up your nice car. And people go through great lengths of time to get their car all cleaned up and ready. And a lot of people, hey, Pop, stay around here. Hey, come on back here. A lot of people, you know, come and meet up at like 7 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning. The show we do up here, we don't call it the Cars and Coffee, but the show I do on Sundays, it's a gathering where people get around in about 9 o'clock. So, I'm just not up for getting out of bed at 5.30 in the morning 
to drive their car show. I mean, I probably should. I probably should do that at, at least at some point. But in our area here at Dulles Landing, where they have the cars and coffee event, it's um it's a pretty big event. I mean, if you go on there on the right day, nice sunny Sunday morning, and the weather's nice, um, you may not even be able to get in to the parking lot. You may be parking across the street. I've heard these stories. I've never been there. It's about 30 minutes from where I am here, 35 minutes. And typically a lot of people from that show break out about 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and they shoot, they shoot up to our show. You know, not all of them. But it's a big event. But the whole point, in, point is the cars and coffee was, uh, you know, can you could you give uh, the reason for cars and coffee because of Starbucks? Could you say that that, you know, well, as we know, Barry McGuire was one of the original guys that started pushing it because he wanted to share his car care products, which that's a great way to interact. You bring your nice shiny car up to the show, and it's dazzling, clean, looks really cool. Wouldn't you have to say that that would, uh, you know, inspire somebody to say, hey, what are you using your car? And I'm sure Barry McGuire had his products there, and it was a great way to promote his products. But at the same time, people go through great lengths of time of getting their cars all nice and cleaned up, just for that reason, to go up there in the morning and show off your pride and joy. And you get to have great conversation. And yeah, people drinking coffee and whatever else. I've always thought about, for me, I go up there and kind of set up a little cars and coffee thing with my stickers. I get a bunch of custom car, um, Ice Age TV, you know, paper cups, logos on them, hand out coffee, you know, maybe get a, a bunch of donuts, eh, just to do something different, to uh, share the uh, the fun and do the car show, and uh, I mean, I've thought about that, I probably should do that, It'd be kind of creative and kind of neat, because when you go up there, you do really meet some great people, I've met a lot of great people up at that car show, and I've got a lot of my people, the, a lot of people watch my channel, um, go to the car meet, and I run into them, and we have the, the giggles and laughs, and fun, and so, uh, and there he is. Come on, let's get up here. Get your butts upstairs because you're just nothing but trouble. So go on up. Come on. Oh, yeah, there we go. Come on, get up there. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Come on, get up. Hey, Tango, Tango, leave him alone. It's just never ending. The dog, the, the, you know, who's the stronger of the pack, right? So, but also you're probably seeing here Triumph hat on. And I got my Triumph logo. Uh, the Triumph Ace Triumph Club or whatever the hell it is. And you're probably saying, well, you know, I'm on the fence of buying a Tiger uh, adventure bike. But I don't know. I'll tell you what. It's really interesting. I've been kind of going around the dealerships, climbing off and off those bikes. And that's one thing with the adventure bike. I've had so many. And I really never do ride it that much. I buy them, get them all bagged up. They look really cool. I'll ride it. But then in the end, I just end up selling it. And But what's really intriguing is, is I've gotten older getting off and on these bigger bikes isn't as easy. And for years, I always <clears throat> went to my bike and I mounted it by standing next to it and just putting my leg over it and get on the bike. Well, what I'm seeing from these other adventure people, they go up and they literally put their foot on the peg here because the bike's up high and then they launch themselves onto the bike by kicking their leg over to get on the bike because it's a tall, it's a high bike. And what I've noticed here is my left side of my back and my leg are really hurting. And I was like, why is this kind of going on? Well, I've been getting off and on these adventure bikes and I'm now really realizing really for me, man, that really throws out the, like the back left side of my back. And I'm just kind of thinking, you know what? I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to go for an adventure bike because I just know who I am. I'll get the damn thing. And sure, I'll ride it a little bit. But for the most part, we'll do what most do. They just sit and collect dust and I don't ride them. And, and as I get older, I really am kind of more favoring the more simplistic bike and a lower bike to the ground and not as heavy a bike. And so even though I get the Honda Goldwing there, but the whole point of this is that that adventure bike, I don't know. I just feel like, eh, I don't know. I just don't like having to you launch yourself to get on that bike. And I'm really supposed to go down there today and test drive it and see if I really want it. They called me last night and said the bike's all ready to go. 
you want us to put the bags on? And I said, don't do that yet. I don't do that yet. Let me, I said, why would I buy this bike without riding it first? Because if you watch my channel, I bought a Indian Pursuit, never test drove the bike. And, and to this day, I don't know if I would have caught that vibration, the, uh, the steering issues with it, the death wobble. I don't know if I ever caught that test driving that bike in the short amount of time I'd ride it at a certain speed. I don't know. But anyways, so I'm supposed to go down there today and test drive it and see if I like it. But my body's saying, nah, I don't think that's the bike for you. And I'm saying, I think you're right. Because it's that having to put my left foot on the peg and then do that launch to enable my leg to uh, kick over that seat to sit on the bike. And then when you're on the bike, it's still a tall bike and you're not really flat footed for me. I'm five foot ten. I'm not flat footed on the ground. It's really more of my tippy toes uh, are kind of on the ground. So I think that. That may not play out. The danger is, okay, so then what do I get in place of that? That's the danger. <laughs> I go down to Triumph dealer, Indian dealer, and then it just turns into a whole nother uh, deal or something like that. I don't know. Uh, but once again, as I progress in life, anybody here that knows, as you get older in life, you know, your your calisthenics and your, your uh, just a lot of things start to change. And... And you just kind of start to step back and think, you know, what makes sense, what doesn't. And that's why I like the Harley Davidson Breakout. It's it's just a light bike. It's low to the ground. It's easy on, easy off. The Road Glide CVO here, you know, same thing. It's heavy bike, but it's not the complete tour bike. The Honda Goldwing, yeah, that bike's you know, a lot of bike in all reality. But it's just such a great bike. And have I ridden out lately? No. I need to. So just kind of updating you on on that as today is a big Harley Davidson reveal. But there's so many cheaters out there on the internet dying to get hits on their channel that they're showing all of the CVO. I mean, there's not gonna be any surprise. Anybody that's going to the big CVO reveal today at a dealership or patiently waiting for that, I think it's um, ten o'clock central time, I think. It'll be about 11 o'clock Eastern time, I guess, would be the time. Here, I think, is a reveal. If I can, Eastern, Central, or Stain, ah, who knows. But anyways, whole point is, there's people out there showing a lot of pictures, a lot of stolen information, per se. And, and it's what I've been talking about. I can, I guarantee you, the Road Glide is this bike right here. With a 117 motor. I, I, I guarantee it. That when they do the reveal, it's going to be the non-CVO. Look exactly like this bike. Maybe not as cosmetic um, flair to it. But guaranteed. Street Glide, guaranteed. It's a new Street Glide CVO. But it won't be a CVO. It'll be the, you know, the less dressed up, less motor motorcycle. And then they're going to have the new Pan America. Which probably... They updated a few things on it, but it's supposed to be a CVO model, possibly. So there it is. If you watch my channel, I just told you what Harley's going to reveal on the big, the big thing. Do they bring anything else? I don't know. Do they, do they show a new touring line? I don't know. I mean, we're not seeing that. We're just seeing the non-touring, what I mean by that, the non-rear tour pack. I'm not seeing any pictures of the, uh, the limited motorcycle where it has the saddlebags and then it has the rear um trunk on it whatever you want to call the rear case and so anyways what what's that going to do for harley davidson besides you know what's going to do to this and unless that thing is very expensive it's not going to do any favors for this motorcycle right here so this is basically a forty-two thousand dollar motorcycle if the higher end you know, but I think they're only making like one model. I don't think they're gonna make like a special and a standard or whatever. So it'd be very interesting to what's the price. Uh, my guess is it's gonna be thirty six nine ninety nine or thirty four nine ninety nine. I would imagine it's be thirty five thousand dollar bike would be my guess um, to have about a seven thousand dollar spread. So if it comes in at thirty six, eh, you know, it doesn't really do. I can't see it really doing anything per se for the CVO, meaning. I don't think it's going to help it gain value. I don't think it's going to make it lose a lot of value. But at the same time, 
we shall see on the uh, the new Harley Davidson big reveal today, and that'll be the car. That'll be the the coffee conversation, I guess, around the table at the uh, the Harley dealers today as everybody waits for the big uh, the big shebang. Right. Meanwhile, for me, technically, I'm supposed to be going down to motorcycles to Dulles and riding around on a Triumph Tiger, which I just don't think I'm gonna do that. Even the Pan America, I'm just not. Eh. I just think I'm just gonna go ahead and pass on that style of bike and have to get another adventure on something else. I think that's where it's all going to kind of play out. And it's interesting how kind of my body has spoken to me more than my mind. <laughs> Is that a good thing? You get older, he, he, who has, he doesn't have that challenge. So for the, for the cars and coffee, for, the, uh, for the, the wealth conversations, I think, boy, oh boy, isn't it just about right and how, what do you do when you, you interact with people that you sit down, have a conversation, and you both enjoy a cup of coffee. And, you know, you can be so many different conversations and topics. And and for us in this country, we're the later of the coffee trend, I believe. My understanding is that the coffee trend was way ahead of us over in Europe. And that's where Howard Schultz got his idea of the Starbucks um, type of uh, selling coffee is from being over there in Europe, and I guess Italy. My understanding is that Howard Schultz was the bean connoisseur. He was the guy that traveled and was purchasing the beans because for the cars and for the uh, Starbucks, the coffee guys, the, the coffee guru guys, back in the early 70s, they were uh, selling coffee bean beans from a company called Pete's Coffee out of San Francisco. So that's very interesting because Pete's Coffee was, in so many ways, a competitor to Starbucks, if you remember this back so many years ago. But in all reality, Pete's Coffee beans were what got the um, Starbucks initial uh, type of idea going. But it wasn't called Starbucks back at that time. It was called some type of coffee and bean uh, shop where all these sold was coffee beans. And sure, I'm, from reading the, you know, the information... As years progressed, they started sampling some coffee, but they never were per se a coffee store where you got up in the morning to go get a cup of coffee. It was more about you going and buying your own beans, and they would sell you a grinder to grind your own beans, and you go back home, and you end up uh, making your own coffee. So it was a lot of, uh, in the 70s through the 80s, a lot of mishaps. Uh, they had a lot of success. They had a lot of failures. And, and I'll kind of read a little bit of that. I kind of saved it on my phone, kind of do some highlights on that. But it goes back to the Starbucks of today. His, his, you know, if you know it, the lattes, the espressos, all the different type of style drinks you can get and how expensive you can, it can get as well to go buy a cup of coffee. But what's interesting is the Pike Place Coffee was always my favorite, not knowing that that was the name of the street that their first store, I think their first official store, or or I should say eventually one of their stores, was uh, opened, was apparently on Pike Place over there in Seattle, Washington. And that's really where the founding, um, you know, all the founders and everybody that um, started it. And Howard Schultz, he didn't come along until like 1988. So even though the college guys got things kind of going in the 70s, um, apparently Howard Schultz uh, interviewed to come in and be like the marketing and the bean um, guy to, you know, buy the beans. And apparently the, the guys didn't like him. They thought he was a New Yorker. They just thought he was just a little too pushy, maybe even abrasive. And so apparently, originally, when he went for that interview, for that position, as that company was starting to get bigger on selling their beans and all, <coughs> that um, they voted not to hire him. And Howard Schultz was so taken back, he went back and he literally got in their face and he challenged them to the point that he convinced them to reverse their decision and to hire him. And so Howard Schultz was really the guy that really revamped the whole uh, initial three guys that started. And some other people came along as well as the company grew in the 80s, but they had their setbacks because of, uh, apparently, due to some wars and other, you know, their bean constraints, they the prices went through the roof. So they went through some very challenging times, 
because the uh, the beans, the coffee beans, became very expensive to import, and they kind of lost the, uh, the, you know, they had challenges getting the beans, but then the consumers and people weren't buying them as much because it was too expensive. And apparently Pete's, I think, <clears throat> eventually they bought out Pete's um, coffee brand. I think that when Howard Schultz came along, or maybe, really, maybe in the late or mid-80s, they think that they bought out Pete's coffee brand, and to bring that in their own house, but they kept the name going. But then, in, apparently, in the 80s, late 80s, Howard Schultz was over there in Europe, in Italy, and he really saw the Italian flair of coffee and these espresso bars, and that's when he came back and he convinced the three uh, initial founders and then, I think, some other people that they should try to um, go that direction of making coffee and that nice creative you know flair and you know whatever somebody else is the more of the coffee connoisseur who knows it better than me but the whole point is it was howard schultz that was really pushing more than ever that you guys need to uh really rebrand on how you're um you know selling coffee beans and get more of selling coffee cups of coffee and so at the same time um one of the founders uh, apparently he looked at some map where he saw this um, star of some town named Starbo. And the way Starbucks' name came to be was this guy was a Moby Dick, I guess, fan. And one of the, uh, the crew crewmates was named apparently Starbuck. So for Ahab, he had a secondhand man on, if you've watched the movie Moby Dick or read the book, you'll see there's a guy named Starbuck. So the, the Starbucks came uh, to be from that one guy, one of the founders, uh, and then they got creative and took a mermaid and made that as the logo because of the Starbuck, you know, the, the ocean, the whale, the mermaids, and that's how the Starbucks name and, uh, and logo came to be. And since its original logo has been changed like two or three times, to the present day uh, way it looks. But then in 1992, the, the guys, the founders, I guess, I think, I think one founder left and there's like two original founders still with the company. I guess they were kind of getting disgruntled with Howard Schultz, maybe. I don't know the real story. Somebody else probably knows better than me. But apparently the, the original uh, um, founders were kind of getting themselves in a financial trouble, I think, maybe. Could be wrong of that. And Howard Schultz, they, they, they decided to sell the company. And Howard Schultz rounded up $3.8 million to buy him out, to buy out the, you know, the company name and, and, and then take it under his own with other investors. Now, I heard about Howard Schultz back like in 1991 or 92 because probably he's 92 because I used to read this magazine called Success Magazine. It was a really cool magazine. So you're going back to really no internet. You didn't really have that back in the early 90s. You still had paper, you know, the newspapers, the magazines. That's how you got all your information. The car magazines. I mean, Border Books, Crown Books. Everybody, you know, I'm sure people, Barnes & Noble. That was, that was huge back then. It was a lot of fun. And that was a lot of fun going to those places. My wife used to love to go there. We'd go there. And you get your coffee and hang out and read your book or magazines, and you buy your CDs. It was pretty cool, which that's all changed. Some are still standing, but the point of that is the Success Magazine that I wrote that I read about. I read about this guy named Howard Schultz, and so his story is from that magazine. Somebody correct me, but he apparently went to what he claims like a hundred investors, hundred bankers, telling him his uh, vision of making coffee shops and making it big by you know selling espresso coffee and all this other stuff, what you see today at Starbucks. And all these bankers are like, no way. We're not going to help you raise any money for this dream of what the consumers aren't going to spend money for this coffee. This isn't Europe. It's not Italy. This, isn't, this country doesn't have that infrastructure. So his claim is he talked to like 100 different bankers and investors and never gave up until he found the few stuck people that helped him round up $3.8 million. You know, today, today's economics, $3.8 million sounds like nothing. 
but you're now talking, you know, 32 years later, if I'm correct on that, uh, in 32 years later, you know, I would imagine that would be like trying to round up, round up seven or eight or nine million dollars in my eyes. But anyways, he uh, he accomplished that, and it's just incredible to think that the original founders witnessed right in front of their eyes after they sold it to Howard Schultz on how it's hard to believe back like in 1992 he only they only had like five or ten or twenty shops. I mean, just as hard for me to believe back in the 90s that it was still a very minuscule operation. And I wonder when the first Starbucks came to like New York City or the first Starbucks came to my area. And, and so it really wasn't until the later 90, later in the 90s and in the 2000 years that the really the big expansion. I mean, I think they have like 300,000, you know, employees. Like, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't even know. I can't, I mean, that's a, I'd have to read that information that I saved on my phone to give you more criteria. But there you go. Howard Schultz. In so many ways, did he create the cars and coffee? I mean, is that where um, Barry McGuire got the idea of, hey, let's all get a cup of coffee and go hang out and walk around our nice, cool cars and uh, show show it off? And that's what it's all about. You want to show off your nice car. You want to share your story of how I got the car. And every person, if you watch my channel, everybody has a story. If you watch my Sunday car meets and you see me walk around, and I pick out a car I think has some uh, interest to others. And I sit there and talk to the person. And they share me the love of their car. And, and they always have a story about the car. So I'm going to get upstairs here because my hands get a little cold. But it's not too bad. I mean, I'm actually not that cold this morning, which is, uh, is good because of all the uh, cold weather we've had. And fighting the cold, my own cold, that is. And here they are. Are they all behaving? They are. Is that amazing? Yes, they've actually been pretty quiet. So, hopefully that stays the way it is, right? As we get upstairs here and continue the ongoing coffee conversations on Ice Age TV. But it's just incredible when you read about the challenges that they had. Challenges that they went through to keep that selling beans... Uh, going. And uh, most of them were working other jobs. And so uh, it's just a really great story, but also just some how hard it is to bring something. You know, it's so challenging. Until you've owned your own company or you've had an endeavor, you know, it's very challenging to bring something to the market and uh, succeed and make any money or whatever it may be. So, all right, here's my phone. And as I was saying to you, I had a few different things that I was wanting to kind of explore. And so Starbuck, I was thinking about the Starbuck. Yeah, the Starbuck guy was the uh, the the, uh, the mate of Ahab for the uh, the captain of the ship. If you haven't ever seen the movie, you should go see the movie for uh, Moby Dick, old old one, but it might be intriguing to know that Starbucks came from the, the Moby Dick movie. Isn't that something? And then here, when you go back to the original founders, this is back in like 1971, Zev Siegel, Siegel, Jerry Baldwin, and Gordon Bowker. I'm sure anybody on the West Coast probably is more in tune with this, especially if any subscribers are out there in the Washington State. I'm sure they probably know a lot more in depth of the true foundings of where Starbucks came from and the guys that started it and how it was um, being run there in Seattle, Washington, is my assumptions, is from uh, the true beginnings. And and then for Howard Schultz, that was a New Yorker guy, that 1988, he's 10 years older than me. So that's pretty incredible. I think back in 1992, you know, how old he was and how he was uh, on the mission to uh, to get his... His vision of uh, what he's done, but there was a quote somewhere here, I think from Howard's. Oh yeah, it's like there's it's never enough. I think Howard Schultz says in his uh, documentary, he's interviewed, and as Schultz once put it, for him, enough is never enough. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I mean that isn't that the truth? I mean that's what I say. I think everybody relates with it. When you're on a, on a journey 
It's always about the journey. But when the journey comes to an end, it's not enough. And that's what uh, I was reading. Oh, I was reading about Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey here recently, he was saying that if you think being rich, being incredibly successful, you know, having anything you want, you know, it was a statement. I wish I would have kept that statement. It was just basically him saying it. It doesn't matter in the end. That is what brings you the happiness. It's the, you know, it's the journey. It's the, the mission. And boy, oh boy, over there, I was talking about this yesterday, over there in Israel, or Yemen, what's going on? It's incredible what's going on. And, you know, it just doesn't seem like the, uh, the media gives a lot of attention. I don't know. I don't really watch the news and all, but it's incredible if you start really reading in great length detail of the Houthi, I guess it's called Houthi, H-O-U-T-H-I, that was Islamic religious um, group. Which they named it after the uh, the founder that got killed over there in Yemen by the Saudis, but if you read about the technology that they that they have access to and what they're using, it's incredible. And that's where we are in today's world of technology. As I drink my coffee here in front of you, it's incredible on how they have access to the drones. I mean, have you seen some of these clips of Ukraine where a drone will track down? A military person and kill them. I mean, it it is the sci-fi stuff is here. It's real. I mean, it's incredible in how you have you're going to have the drone cop. There's no doubt in my mind where we're going next is the drone cop. You're going to have drone cops on the highways going down the highway that are going to pull you over. You think that you think they're making this stuff up? There's no doubt in my mind that's going to take a you know. I mean, the, these drones are going to be artificial intelligence. They're going to have programmed in. Your license plate, the picture of who you are, you know, they're going to know everything about you. And the drone will make you pull the window down and it'll see that, that you sit in the car driving a car and you're going to get a ticket mailed to you. But this will be a real deal. Unlike the photo, um, the ones are uh, the people, uh, the, you know, you go through a, 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 a inter, go through an intersection or go down the street and the, you get a, a picture taken of your vehicle and then you get a, a bill in the mail for going over speed limit or making a right-hand turn, whatever. But that type of ticket never gives you any points against your uh, your license because they don't know who's driving the car. But I think where it's going to the next level is these drones. These drones are going to be the new police force of going around cities. I mean, I just really think it's here. And if you watch these clips over in Ukraine, there's a clip here I saw yesterday where here's this um, tank uh, military guy that apparently he's gotten out of his tank because it's been disabled. And a drone sh shows up and chases him around the tank and then obliterates him. I mean, just beyond believable. The whole drone and him are, you know, blown up. It's, you know, it's those, what's those ID devices that are in the ground. The irony is you've got people out there trying to track these buried bombs, but yet that doesn't work anymore. The bombs are coming in from you through the air in drones. So the whole point of that is over there in Yemen, with this ongoing uh, war between Saudi Arabia, but it's really about Hamas. It's really about how we're now in the Gaza Strip with Israel, and we're doing, we're supporting Israel, and other nations are as well, because it's the Jews against Islam in so many ways. And so this is really a revenge by them against our country and other countries, and they're wanting to totally um, take away that um, shipping capabilities through the Red Sea, and they're totally wanting to uh, create havoc for the world on you being able to get goods and for things to get more expensive and for the fear and everything else because they're not happy with what's been happening in the world. And Iran is all behind this. They say right now there's a $15 million bounty on one of Iran's top commanders that was in Iraq taking out our soldiers and other, uh, other military personnel. And that guy apparently is behind a lot of the infrastructure of this Houthi, if, you, if I say it five times, but it, that they're, they're giving them all the military um, weapons of incredible you know, devices and missiles, 1,100-mile you know, missile capability. So we're in a, a terrorist militia guerrilla war. 
even though we're over there right now bombing the hell out of the Yemen areas of where they think a lot of their ammunitions are being stored and, and everything else. But this is a real thing. I mean, we're in, we're in war. I mean, it just blows me away And how this country, this the Joe Biden administration, I talk about all the time. Here's another article it is Sean Fain is, you know, now on the page is so wanting to go after Tesla, BMW, Honda, Toyota, Nissan, and bring, <coughs> and bring them, bring them in house on the UAW and how you and how Sean Fain is not going to back down and he's going to he's going to force the hand that all these manufacturers got to start playing is playing by the UAW's rules. So, but it talks about it's a very it's a Wall Street Journal article. This is the article that is like reading a book and it just talks about what Sean Fain has accomplished, but what he's done to the pay. A part-time UAW guy that makes seventeen dollars an hour now makes forty-four dollars an hour, and it's incredible. And then, in the end of the deal with that UAW deal, all the union people got between the, their pay raise and compensation a thirty-three percent pay increase. And so you just and now this big concern is is the EV agenda. He's met with Joe Biden, and he kind of likes Joe Biden, but he doesn't know if he likes Joe Biden because. He's all about the green agenda. And they're very, very concerned about this electric vehicle technology coming in and eliminating their jobs. If Elon Musk um, shows us his brand new factory, I guarantee you it's probably takes one third to one quarter of the manpower of uh, employees to run his new manufacturing plant, which he's going to reveal here before long. And show the world how he has mastered the uh, manufacturing and building cars through all the AI and all the robots and all this technology. And so for this guy Sean Vane, the, 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 the you know the the paintings on the wall that with all the EV trends with, right now they're saying that 3,700 jobs have been cut with Stellantis due to California's new very strict emission guidelines for a plant that designs and builds cars will no longer be sellable in California. So apparently Stellantis just laid off like 3,700 union people. And that's what Sean Fain's concern is, is that the stricter guidelines are going to totally just start eliminating UAW positions because of the new technology of alleged vehicles. So he, in some ways, would like to see Donald Trump uh, run for office because he thinks Donald Trump's going to put a stop to this crazy, fast um, changeover to electric vehicles. So, and typically, the union sides with the Democrats. But this time, they're saying he has not picked a candidate yet. He has not endorsed um, Joe Biden. So, could Donald Trump, in so many ways, be his savior for the UAW? But, you know, at the same time, yeah, you know, it's, 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 I mean, come on. What's going on right now with this, this administration hanging out billions of dollars and all the companies are setting up shop in, in California and all these EPA, and all these penalties. I mean, it just isn't going to stop. I just can't see it. The transition is going to continue to go. The only thing I can see is Donald Trump would just slow it down some. I don't see him being able to just make it come to a halt. I see it maybe, you know, taking a little bit more of a transition. And But even though all these EV makers are cutting back, Ford's cutting back on the building their cars. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, what is it, right? What's the real story? I guess we'll have to keep that for another day of, of coffee, coffee conversation, right? Cars and coffee, that's it. I'm going to kind of wrap it up there and call another day on the Ice Age TV morning conversations, cars and coffee, and shoot with the weather being the way it is. I haven't been up to a car meet in, it seems like, ages. And I travel usually so much, I might have been around town a lot, even to be at the car meet, but now it's been more about the weather than anything else. So, uh... Yeah, what I'm going to do today, what adventure, what's my next adventure, right? Besides the tractor adventure, yeah, I need to get into all that. That's a whole other conversation, a whole other day. So I'm going to leave it at that. It's 40 minutes, long, long talk. I know that. I get it. So as always, stay safe, be happy, have a great day. God bless. Stay tuned. Share the channel. Oh, anybody want an Ice Age TV sticker? Nobody's been calling or emailing Ice Age TV comments at gmail.com if you want to share the ice age 
TV sticker on one of your vehicles, or if you need a few of them, you have a few vehicles, tell me you want to, I'll send them to you. IceHTVComments at gmail.com. Email me and tell me your name and address, and I won't sell your information. I, I promise. I won't do it. I won't. Hey, have a great day.